Uh, good afternoon, Chris. How are you? I'm doing great, Moose and Maggie. How are you? We're doing, doing well. well. Thanks for hopping on the board. Man, Chris, I, I've, I've always wanted to talk with you because I think your career is really fascinating, and we're going to get to, like, baseball and football and all that stuff. But if there is ever a show that is begging for a reboot, it's best damn sports show, period. Like, that would fit in so perfectly right now yeah. in the sports landscape. Like, you guys were kind of early to that in, like, 2000, 2001, whenever that show debuted. Like, has anyone talked about a reboot of that show? Yes. <laughs> I have, surprised. at least. Uh, um, I can tell you this. I st- It hasn't been on since 2009. We closed up shop in June of 2009, and I still get asked about it. Yeah, And the crazy thing is, is that, and we'll get into the Chris Rose rotation, um, the six active major leaguers, like four of them have brought it up on the show, you know, and I've got guys who I covered in the major leagues, like Stephen Boat, if you guys remember the catcher who's kind of bounced around, I think he's still in Arizona, but a great, great guy. He came up to me one year in spring training. He goes, Chris, when I was in college at Azusa Pacific, our baseball team sat in the audience and watched Best Damn. (laughs) I was like, and now you're interviewing me because it's very <laughs> weird. But yeah, the whole the whole idea of kind of allowing athletes to get outside of their sport, and they didn't have to be an expert. You know, John Sally didn't have to be an expert on the NFL, but he could have an opinion on the quarterback carousel. And we just kind of broke down some barriers that I thought in the beginning of the century we were, and I'm a huge sports fan. We were taking it too seriously. We needed places where we could just laugh and enjoy because isn't that the whole point of sports? Like we don't have to all be buttoned up and dressed up in suits and look beautiful and all that. Like I love sports because it's fun and it makes me laugh and it makes me cry and it takes me so many emotional directions. Why can't we have a show that kind of mirrors that of the fan? And I thought that's what we did best back in the day. You know, Chris, of of everything that and all the experience you have, is that, you know, what's the biggest thing where, and we'll get to your podcast here momentarily, and it's great, um, but, you know, for those that are, you know, you've adapted, you've changed, I mean, you've done a lot in this industry, what are kind of the, some of the things that you, you've taken away from your experience, or uh, you know, doing everything that you've done? To be a great listener. I, I think it's the most important thing. When I talk to college I'm sorry, kids, what was that? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Just kidding. Exactly. Exactly. I'm not so now I'm not so sure I'm great at it, but it's yeah. the thing I would like to be great at most. Like I listened to Oprah's interview the other night, right? If you listen to her, it was a master class in listening. Yeah. Everybody thinks I always ask this question when I do um you know, virtual seminars with college kids. I said, what do you think is the most important body part of an interviewer? And they're like, well, it's your mouth or your eyes or something. I was like, no, it's your ears because you want to listen because you could be prepared. You could have all these wonderful questions on a sheet written out and, and have done all your research. But if you don't listen to how another human being thinks and delivers what's going on in their space, then you're going to miss some opportunities. And it's, I think it's the thing that I enjoy most about this new podcast is I'm sitting down for 70 minutes with a major leaguer, which you never get that sort of time with them. You get six or seven minutes. You can't go very deep here. We're going places that I never thought we would go. And that's, I think that's the most important lesson I've learned from over the years and everything. Yeah, the other good thing about like what Oprah does, and all the good ones do this, Oprah, Howard, you know, Dan Patrick is really good, Rome is really good, yeah. like the people who are those really awesome interviews, I'm probably leaving people out, but you know, what they do, and sometimes what's most effective, is not having this brilliant follow-up question that checks every box, it's, what? Yeah. It's, you know, it like, doesn't have to be this whole like brilliant follow-up, sometimes just your natural reaction is the follow-up, and then it goes from there. Okay, so you finally get a chance to have these major leaguers, current major leaguers, open up to you. Have you found that they have like really opened up? Because we all know sometimes interviewing athletes, like they can clam up a little bit too because they have a lot at stake, and they know if they say something that's headline-worthy, it's going to go very far. Well, first of all, I, I want to get this – I, I want to be transparent. This is a partnership I have with these guys. Okay. I'm not, I'm not talking about a monetary partnership. I'm talking about like an emotional connection that these guys have to be able to trust me because they're not guests on the Chris Rose rotation. The six guys, and you just had Trevor May on 90 minutes ago, they are the co hosts. When you listen to an episode of the Chris Rose rotation, they're not in and out in 15 minutes, they're there for the entire 70 minutes. 
And the next time you have Trevor May on, which I believe will be next Monday <laughs> uh, or or two weeks, I'm kind of confused on where we are with the taping schedule, but yeah. he's going to, he's going to have a guest too. We're going to have, so there will be another active major leaguer that's joining us and he's going to be asking the questions too. And they have to be able to trust where I'm going to take them. It doesn't mean that I won't go to some sensitive areas because I will. I mean, I, I have to be honest with you. We've taped the first time through the rotation. So all six of these guys, Trevor May, Archie Bradley of the Phillies, Miguel Rojas of the Marlins, Tyler Glass now of the Rays, Stephen Brault of the Pirates, Lucas Giolito of the White Sox. Two of the six guys actually cried. I wasn't trying to make them cry, but based on what we talked about, they did. What made they them were cry? Like, well, for Rojas, it was talking about his his mom, yeah, who's meant everything to him and has battled health issues. And this is a guy that was dropped off in this country at age 17 from Venezuela, not knowing a lick of English, and sent up to the Reds short season rookie ball team in Billings, Montana. And nice. now he's the player rep and leader of the Miami Marlins. Like, think about where he's gone in 15 years. You know, Lucas Giolito... It had to do something with his grandfather, who was yeah. a World War II veteran. I didn't know that going into it. And he, you know, he, he volunteered this information. So they have to be able to trust me that I, that it's okay for pro athletes to be vulnerable. And I think they're learning that. Like, it's okay to be human. And they right. want to you share that stuff. Yeah, you don't have to be a cyborg, right? And because, and then you have the connectivity, Chris. You know what? You know because there's a lot of podcasts that are out there, Chris. What mm -hmm. you know your vision? You mentioned you know the the six major leaguers that you're going to be talking to, and you're going to be talking about a, a myriad of different topics and other guests over the course of it. You know your vision and the and and working with John Boy Media, your vision of separating yourselves from the other um, you know podcast baseball podcasts that are out there. Well, I think first and foremost is the fact that what I just mentioned is that you don't have the opportunity where active major leaguer is talking to active major leaguer. Like CC and and Ryan Rucco did a great job of yeah. when CC was wrapping up his career, but CC's no longer, and he's a good friend of mine. He's no longer active. He's still close to the game. He's right. still working with the Yankees, but it's different when you're dealing with the daily grind. So we're going to get a totally different perspective there. Um, and as I mentioned, you don't get to hear active major leaguers talk for 70 minutes un un uninterrupted. So we really get to peel back the layers. And that's been the biggest response I've heard from, from viewers and fans so far is that like, I had no idea about this person. Now I love them. And I think major league baseball, I worked at MLB network where people I love dearly for 10 years, our sport does the worst job of telling us who we're cheering for. Like, I know what number, I know their stats, but I don't know who they are. That's hopefully what the Chris Rose rotation does, so that when you're cheering for Trevor May as a Met, you get to know who he is, not just that he's pitching. You know, Chris, Chris Rose is our guest. I, I think that, like, people are kind of baffled by that because, you know, you, you look at MLB Network, the programming is great. It's not for a mm -hmm. lack of professionalism there or for, for creativity, that's for sure. Like, you were, be able, you were able to go behind the curtain there. Like, why still at this point – does baseball, why is it fair to criticize baseball for not marketing their stars better? I just don't think that, listen, I, I tried to do a, a podcast with Kevin Millar, my partner on Intentional Talk, several years ago. And there was no support for it. I don't know why. Because it's the best way to get to know players. And I, I don't know if it's because they're so stuck in their thinking. And I'm not here to bash major league baseball. I have a great relationship with it. It brought me and my family some incredible memories, but they're more interested in protecting the entity and the three initials of MLB than they are in introducing us to the players that would continue to grow MLB. And I don't have an answer for it. So you, I, you but I think it sucks. Well, but you're in this unique <laughs> position. No, no kidding. We all love baseball, so we'll agree with you. But you're in the unique position because you also work for NFL Network. What's yes. What's the difference there? Because the NFL is also protecting, you know, the three letters um, mm -hmm. so much. The shield. But they're still able to market their stars. Like what you you work for both places. Like what's the biggest difference? I think the the difference is is that um, you remember a couple years ago when the NFL was penalizing people for celebrating in the end zone. 
Yes. Thank you, Mike Pereira. And then, like, and then like a week later, they're like, no, 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 go for it. And now they encourage it, right? Yeah. They listened to the fan base. Like the fan base was like, and and they probably looked at their social media and realized that the celebrations that were out there were being most watched by 12-year-olds, right, on their phones. They're not dumb. They're smart. They were like, holy smokes, uh, we shouldn't be penalizing this because the consumer's eating it up. So they're good with OBJ doing whatever he does on social media and all that because it'll help promote their brand too. Here, I don't think MLB has wrapped its hands around this, that that there are guys more so than just Trevor Bauer who can help the sport grow. And you don't have to be fighting against one another that you can work in concert. And hopefully this podcast allows them to see that. I really hope so. Yeah, and, and I think it will, Chris. And But here's the, you know, in, in, the foot, in, in the NFL, everybody cares about everything. Right. Like, so I could ask a, a, you know, a a giant fan about his thoughts about Russell Wilson and the Seattle Seahawks, and they care and they've got a passionate opinion about it. The problem with Major League Baseball, and I want to ask you a question about Manfred as well, is it's so regionalized now. Right. You only, a lot of baseball fans only care what's happening on their block with their team in their city. They're not necessarily focused on what's going on with the Astros rotation or what's going on with Artie Moreno and the Angels. They, you know, it's you don't have that crossover. It's so regionalized in Major League Baseball, and it seems to get worse by the year. It does. It's a great point. Uh, it, it's something I never really was able to to figure out when I worked on the national perspective. Like, okay, do we just care about the Yankees nationwide or the Dodgers? Like. Let's be honest here. When TV executives are putting their schedule together, the only teams you're going to see on there on a consistent basis are the Yankees, the Red Sox, the Cubs, and the Dodgers. The rest they could say, it really doesn't matter. Maybe they'll sneak the Cardinals and the Braves in there occasionally. But the rest of it, they just don't care. So how do we make people care about it? You know, once again, it's developing these personalities, bringing out the, you know, when I joined MLB Network in 2010 originally, a lot of my friends were like, why are you doing that? Baseball is a boring ass sport. And I was like, I don't think it's the sport that's boring. I think it's the way we've covered it. That's boring. So hopefully with intentional talk, we brought some fun to it. Yeah. Hopefully with this, it's the same sort of thing. And I think that's kind of where you start is you get the kids interested in buying into the people too. I mean, football naturally has a tempo too. same thing with basketball. Baseball does not have a, a great tempo where we feel like there's an immediacy to it. Like, you could miss a game on July 27th and be like, eh, it's okay. You can't do that in the NFL because you feel like you missed part of the storyline. Definitely. Chris Rose is our guest. Okay, Chris, you, you've you've done you've almost done it all, I would say. Like, there's very few people you can say, you know, from hosting World Series pregame shows to doing play-by-play for the NFL. I mean, you really have done it all. Best damn sports show mentioned that. Who is the most misunderstood athlete that you either interviewed or come mm-hmm. in contact with, 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 like, somebody who the reality of being around them was so different from the public persona or the public, whatever the public sees? That's a great one. There's somebody that, uh, man, you might have stumped me, Maggie, on this one. You really, <laughs> I to. Yeah, you might have. You might have gotten me. Because I think that, um, you know, I, I, I was fascinated. I, I will tell you who I'm most fascinated by right now in, ba- in the baseball world is Trevor Bauer. Because I think he really wants to be the most popular, and, and this is probably blasphemy up there. In, yeah, in we're New not York over it yet. We're not based, over it yet. Based on what happened with the Mets, but he really wants to be the most popular player in baseball. Like he wants – that's part of his goal is – But, but is, what does he want to be known dude. for? Because does he want to be no, – does he want to be popular come hell or high water, doesn't matter how he gets there, or does he want to be popular – by showing people how to pitch. See, that's what I can't tell with Bauer. Like, why does he want to, like, what does he well, want to do all over with that the place. fame? Yeah. Let's yeah. start with this. He's all over the place. Like, I don't think he's singularly focused. I think Which he is, is fine. I just, I don't know why he, I don't know if he wants to be famous, infamous. You know, I can't tell with him. Yeah, no, I think, I think it's everything. I think he is the guy who says, hey, as long as you spell my name right, the press, whether it's good or bad, is fine with me. You know? And... 
you know, so there are there are people who are not going to like him based on some of the moronic stuff he's done on social media. I, I don't agree with everything he's done at all. But man, I I think he's done about as good a job of growing the interest in the game as anybody. You know, a lot of guys shy away from it. They would they just want to go play baseball and that's OK. He's not. He is super focused on growing his media company and continuing to pitch great. And by the way, you know, he's not just a guy who wants to spread the gospel. He wants to be the best. Yeah. A few years ago, he talked about winning six Cy Young Awards. Well, and Chris, he also wants to do it his way too, right? Totally. I mean, with I mean, that's that's the other thing as well. I mean, when when you have Sandy Alderson saying, you know, we as a, an organization can learn from Trevor Bauer. I mm-hmm. mean, that's more than just tickling the toes of Trevor Bauer. That is, you know, that's a fee in the frenzy. I mean, Trevor Bauer wants to look at his style, his way, the advanced analytics, the way he throws, the way he works out in the offseason to kind of be the tone and the temperament for pitchers moving forward. Yeah, well, also, I talked to one of the Dodgers after Bauer signed, and I said, did you do any homework on him? And he goes, well, I knew him a little bit, you know, heard – he actually was a really good teammate. He goes, the bugaboo on him is the social media. And, you know, I think it's, it's going to be interesting to see how that plays out in Los Angeles. I know it's his hometown, but if he goes the wrong direction again on social media with something, it'll be very, very interesting to see how that plays in that clubhouse. You know, Chris, how can baseball, we go into it, we're here in New York, right? The Mets are now with a new owner spending, Mm -hmm. uh, and they spent before, but spending to a larger extent. The Yankees are the Yankees. The Dodgers payroll is at $250 million. When you look at baseball, we always like to focus on what's wrong with baseball. Well, one of the things what's wrong is there's a great discrepancy between the haves and the have-nots in Major League Baseball. When you look at teams tearing it down, how do you create a better middle in competition for Major League Baseball? I think you have to get lucky with an owner that'll spend. I really do. And I'm just going to Francisco Lindor for people that don't know, I'm a huge Cleveland fan. I grew up there die hard through and through. And so are my kids, even though they were both born in Los Angeles, what the Indians had to do with Francisco Lindor is despicable. He's the best player I've seen. I just turned 50. He is the best player I've seen put on an Indians uniform. And I knew from the minute he got called up and had his first hit in Detroit in 2015 that they turned the hour, the sand in the hourglass over that there was only a finite time with that. How screwed up is that, that the Indians fans have to get a Jersey with somebody's number on it, but they have to Velcro his name on the back that they can't get it stitched in. That's horrible. It's so bad. And even the owner who, I've had a handful of conversations with him and he's a nice, nice man, but for him to come out publicly a year and a half or two years ago and say, Hey, listen, who knows about the contract? So enjoy Francisco while he's here, basically admitting that we're on borrowed time. Right. So you have to have, you can't change the owners. And that's the hardest part of this equation, (laughs) right? Like Indians fans are screaming, like, why didn't Stephen Cohn, by the Indians, please. <laughs> You're talking about the Dodgers, but then I had to right? go to the Mets. I know, well, as every Jets fan who's listening to the sound of our voice is just kind of like slowly nodding their head and probably a single tear rolls down, rolls down their cheek. But anyway, um, Chris Rose is our guest. I thought Mookie Betts was worse. I mean, not saying, and I feel bad yes. for the Cleveland fans for for losing out of Lindor, but Betts was so right. much worse. I mean, you got Boston, That that's a small t- – I mean, that shouldn't be where you're losing a guy because you can't pay him $400 million. That's nuts to me. So, okay, last one for me, Chris, and, and thanks so much for being so generous with your time today. You're a big Cleveland fan through and through. Congrats. The Browns make the playoffs. They break through yes. last year. It was magnificent. Are people in Cleveland expecting that Odell Beckham is going to be on the team next year or not? That is a that is a toss up. Uh, I thought for sure prior to his injury that he was going to get traded. Uh, he just, he's not owed any guaranteed money until he got hurt, and then you know they, they had to kind of eat that. I think they would have moved on from him had he not been injured this year. With that being said, I still could see them trading him once he gets medically cleared and and a team can look at him and all that sort of stuff. I just don't see a way in today's game where you would want two $15 million a year receivers. I mean, maybe they could restructure Jarvis Landry and ease the burden, but there's still too many holes, uh, particularly in Cleveland's defense to get to where it wants to get. 
And um, just and if I were running a team, I wouldn't pay two receivers 15 mil each. You know, I know that the Buccaneers are going to end up doing it with, with Mike Evans and tagging Chris Godwin, but I think that's a risky proposition. I really do. And Chris, by the way, nothing against Odell. Yeah. Because I think he's handled himself great in Cleveland. There were a few times where I think he could have gone, it could have gone sideways. It hasn't. I just, there has been no fluidity with him in the offense. And I can't, for the life of me, figure it out. Chris, how long do you think Brady keeps playing? I think he wants to play till he's 45. So he's going to be 44 in August, right? I mean, as long as they protect him and they did a great job building up that offensive line. You know, and they looked great in the second half of the season. So Giselle's not going to get her wish anytime soon of him stepping away. I don't get it, by the way. Like, I, <laughs> I, I did. I asked the question when we were covering the Super Bowl this year. Like, what? why is it that he's still playing? Like, at some point, when is enough enough for him? You know, like, I'm not saying, hey, stop playing. But at some point, you are going to miss certain aspects of your kids' lives. Like, when they start playing sports – in the fall and you're preparing for a game against the Carolina Panthers. You can't yeah, when did, when is back. enough enough? What more does he I, have to prove? I, I get it. And you're, you're not wrong about enough. that. You his first, understand? Chris, here's the deal. His first love is football. His only love is football because he is completely committed to football. Well, he is, but he's, you know, I did. I, I, w- I would disagree with you, Moose. I think that he really does desperately love his family, and what? But I don't think he knows how to turn it off. Gotcha. I think he's worried about what is next for him. What is going to fill that appetite of him sitting down and watching hours and hours of game film so that he is uber prepared? There is nothing in life that could fill that void. It's not going to be golf or some other business venture. There's nothing TV that. 12. It- yeah, come on. No, Chris, <laughs> I think there's a part of him where he said this before. He feels like he gets to be his true self on a football field. And, like, remember even him going back and forth? Was it Tyron Matthew, right, where he was drawing back and forth with Matthew? Yeah. I yeah. mean, I think that he feels like that's the release for him. And, like, what do you do when you don't have your release? That's got to be scary. Absolutely. It is for a lot of athletes. But particularly for him, who is yeah. so meticulous in his preparation. And just he loves being the best but i guess my point is is that he's got seven rings right he's got like we're not going to look at him any differently if he gets number eight next year no it's gonna be the same right it'll be like well okay you did it Maybe even joe like, even joe montana's given up the argument he's like listen <laughs> right. mercy uh he's the greatest of all time don't even bring me up in the discussion anymore i think next time you yeah. can just dunk the lombardi trophy instead of throwing it from one boat to the next just dunk that the- was <laughs> that was the best ever I loved though it. seeing him hammered and stumbling around like it was per- like all these people who were like oh tom what do you t- you know you're setting such a poor example well then go be a parent and talk to your kids like you be the parent it's not tom brady's job to parent your kids if you didn't like seeing it and by the way you should tell your kids when you get of age, and if you're old enough and you, you're you celebrating a seventh Super Bowl, you better be hammered and stumbling around and throwing the Lombardi trophy and kicking it around like it's a hacky sack. Let's go for it. I'm in. Chris uh, Rose is parenting. Hashtag day drinking. Uh, that's <laughs> oh, yeah. You got to see my kids. They're stumbling all over the place. Hey, Chris, we appreciate the time this afternoon. Good luck. Uh, the Chris Rose Rotation Podcast, John Boy Media. It's a fantastic listen. Check it out. If you haven't checked it out up until this point, Chris does a great job. And thanks for hopping on giving us a great uh, 25 minutes, Chris. We appreciate it. Moose and Maggie, it was my pleasure, and uh, make sure you have me back at some of this. was a ton of fun. I mean, I'm unfortunately, I'm available. Like, yeah, well, absolutely. We'll tomorrow? get you on plenty. Absolutely. You I got like it. it. All right, guys, stay healthy up there. Thanks, you got Chris. it. Thanks, Same Chris. To you. All right, we got to take a quick break. Really sorry about Lindor. <laughs> sorry, not sorry. Yeah. <laughs> sorry, Chris. We'll oh, enjoy watching them here in New York, Chris. You know what sort of uh, prices therapists charge out here in L.A.? <laughs> <laughs> it's enough, please. It's enough.